Yeah, welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Raphael, as just said. Um, I'm a performance engineer um, from Germany, actually. And I only found out yesterday, or realized only yesterday, that Ukraine is playing my home nation tonight. So I'll, I'll, I'll figure out how I solve this problem. I just have to shut myself down if I go to the fan mile. Um, yeah, well, uh, I live in Norway, though. I live in Oslo, where I'm a consultant. Um, and I'm doing, currently, I'm doing a lot of um, contracting for APM tools. Uh, you probably all have, have used the APM tools at some point in your life. And um, so in this, this way, I'm concerned a lot with performance. And the fun thing about performance is that in the software community, we like to discuss a lot, like what com programming language is the best language, right? We have all opinions. Is functional programming better? Is Scala better than Java, better than Groovy? But we often forget about uh, the hardware of things, right? Every program is executed on, on a machine. Uh, the Java virtual machine is just a virtual machine that in the end generates machine code for us. And as a matter of fact, um, even though we like to forget about what the JVM does, uh, what we write in our programs has quite some impact on the performance of our applications. And over the recent years, uh, we have moved a lot to the cloud, right? So we run applications, we run code in the cloud where every cycle, in a way, costs us money. So performance in the recent years has become much, much more crucial uh, than when we just ran software on our mainframe service, which we already had paid for anyways. And so uh, at least I, I see that as a bigger and bigger interest in, in performance engineering in the Java virtual machine space. And today I'm trying to talk uh, about what the JVM actually does. Um, many of you have probably an approximate overview of that. And I'll give you some tips not so much uh, about what you can do to make a program really fast, which uh, requires rather deep knowledge about the JVM, but I'll, I'll show you some pitfalls, what you absolutely shouldn't do, but ma what many programmers are doing, um, what hinders the performance of an application. All right. So, oh, wait, this is actually the wrong slide set. I'm giving another talk. Sorry, I was uh, just replacing slides. Um, I, I'm typically running PowerPoint in a virtual box um, on Windows from my Linux machine, which doesn't always work, uh, and today didn't. So this is the talk I'm talking about. The other one is, is what I'm doing in the afternoon. Um, it's about bytecode engineering and instrumentation, which is uh, also very interesting, so please come by. All right, so uh, performance talk disclaimer. Everything I tell you today, you should uh, take with a grain of salt. And I'm saying this particular for those people, there's a camera here, right? If you uh, follow with the JVM, um, in, in 10 years from now, what I say today is probably not longer accurate, right? And it's actually a problem. If you go on Stack Overflow and you Google performance advice uh, somewhere and you find these answers with a thousand uh, upvotes partly, they are not longer true. It's, the JVM has changed a lot, especially since Oracle took over. Oracle has really did, did a lot of great work performance-wise. The Java virtual machine is much, much faster than it was in the times of Java 4, Java 5. Uh, and this is also an important reason why you should always upgrade your JVM. And it has been done a lot. If you just go to Mercurial and you check out the hotspot virtual machine and you look what they have changed in there, it's insane. It's basically a new program today. So, and with this, since performance in a way is an implementation detail, um, these things change, of course. The, the mapping of the JVM of your program to machine code has changed. And also, in particular, I'm talking about the hotspot virtual machine today. This is the hotspot virtual machine that comes with the, the OpenJDK or the Oracle JDK. There's a whole bunch of other JVMs, in particular IBM's J9. So if you run WebSphere, you have different performance uh, behavior. Or if you run Azul, for example, um, also another VM, they have different optimization specter. Um, Azul, for example, is aiming for latency, while Hotspot mostly is, is, is um, aiming for throughput, especially in relation with garbage collection. And in particularly, nothing I say today is true for the Delvic virtual machine. So an Android device has entirely different performance um, behavior. It's in a completely different JVM, uh, even though they port it now to the OpenJDK or they derive it from the OpenJDK. For example, the JIT compiler is entirely different. All right. 
So uh, let's start with the basics though. Um, how, how does you code run? When you write a Java program, how is this program executed? Um, we just all write Java code or any um, code that runs on the Java virtual machine. So it might be Java, Scala, uh, Clojure, it doesn't really matter. Uh, in the end, or in the first step, we compile our source code, right? We use Java C, we use Scala C, any compiler to create Java bytecode. And Java bytecode, in a way, is the language of the Java virtual machine. The JVM, even though it's called Java virtual machine, doesn't know the Java programming language at all. It only knows bytecode. There's an abstraction layer, and that makes it possible that many languages run on the JVM, like Scala, like Clojure. They're all the same language, in a way, right? And this is how far we often go. This is how most developers look into their programs. They have compiled it, and then it's off and not their responsibility. However, most of the um, uh, logic concerning performance um, optimization is happening later. And um, once we give the bytecode to the JVM, we have a JIT compiler that compiles this bytecode into machine code, into heavily optimized machine code, which is specific for your platform. So, yes? Is there a question or? No, okay, sorry. Uh, if you have questions, by the way, just ask them. It's, this talk is very dynamic in length. I have just, in the, in the end, a lot of optimization techniques that the JVM applies. Um, I rather get through four of them and you all get it uh, compared to getting through 10 of them and you don't got, get any of them, right? So, um, once the JVM virtual machine has produced machine code, there comes another performance layer. This is the processor. The processor also does some optimization work and um, especially in concurrency um, concerns, it really matters what hardware architecture you're running. And this black box I want to open with you today, um, at least to some extent, to give you an intuition what is good and what is bad for a program. That'll also break everything down to like really basic advice. Okay. So, your program uh, is in a certain state at every time, in a point in time. So when you start, let's say you have a public static void main that just prints out hello world. Then this can happen really fast. Because uh, every program in a Java virtual machine starts out in interpreter mode. Interpreter mode means basically that the JVM just steps through every instruction. You say print hello world, it does that. It says add one plus two, it does that in exact disorder. And this uh, basically interpreter mode is called level zero uh, execution. And as you can see, this is just one of, of several steps. Um, there's also two compilers, and basically a compiler takes your bytecode, your, your Java code that you already compiled to bytecode, and compiles it a second time to the specific hardware that you're running. And we have two compilers in the JVM. One is the client compiler, the C1 compiler, and one is the server compiler, the C2 compiler. The names are historically, in old JVMs, it made the difference if you run the JVM in server mode where everything was compiled a lot, but compilation takes time. And uh, on, on desktop computers, you used client mode such that your program could start up quicker and you wouldn't spend as much time compiling, but your program wouldn't be as fast. Uh, in modern JVMs, we have rather a dynamic life cycle. So everything starts out in level uh, zero and then it goes through different levels. We have in the C1 compiler, we have actually three levels where the JVM does a lot of profiling. What profiling is, I'll explain in a second. Then we end up in the best performance state, which is basically the, the profile-based optimization, the C2 level, uh, level four. So as I said, every, every program starts in level one, or program is rather every method. The JVM compiles method by method. So every method in your program uh, is a, a potential subject for compilation. That's, for example, not true for Delvic anymore. This is just Hotspot and Azul and, and J9. Once you run a method a bit off, more often than one time, the JVM will create some basic machine code for this uh, method. What it will, however, also do is it will start profiling a method. Profiling means, in this context, it will um, uh, analyze the behavior of a method. Let's say you have a statement that says, if true, um, then do this, and if else, then do that on other thing. And let's say this if true is uh, if debug. So if debug will probably never change um, in your entire application's life, right? Because uh, in the production system, you don't have debug activated. Then the JVM profiles this if statement in a way that it says, okay, debug is actually never true, so I'll remember that. I'll remember here that debug is not true, and I will later, 
in the uh, level four stage, compile machine code that takes this information into consideration, right? So this profile that is collected will, at a later point in time, influence the decisions um, that the compiler makes. And this is a very crucial difference of a virtual machine to a hardware level compilation. Like if you write a C program, a C program has no information about your runtime behavior at all, right? So, so that's why Java today, because of this profile-based optimization, sometimes is faster than C code. It's because your Java program cheats in a way. Your Java program creates a program that is um, optimized for your exact execution pattern, right? So if you have a huge library and uh, you only ever use three methods of this library, your JVM will really look how are you using these library methods, these generic library methods, and optimize them accordingly to your usage, right? This is an important uh, deterministic uh, today, and that's why Java is, is so successful, partly. It is not only a very easy language to use with memory management and so forth, it's also very, very performant. All right. And this looks very f straightforward now. However, a method can uh, run through different um, um, yeah, life cycles than that. Another life cycle, for example, is this one. We go to level two. The problem is with this profiling is that it is rather expensive, right? You have to count every invocation, for example, of a method. You have to look how loops are working out. You have to check how um, if statements are working out. And every time the JVM spends time analyzing your code, it, by definition, this process is busy, right? And it cannot spend executing your code. So profiling is expensive. That's why, why benchmarking Java is so difficult as well, right? If you measure the time it takes um, to execute some code, you might first observe it in level zero, then you might have a pause for compilation to level three, then level three might have so much performance overhead by profiling, and once you have ended your, your, your small benchmark, right, you finally reach level four, um, and then you already ended your measurement and you say like, okay, this method is slow, I have to throw it away and write it differently. That might not be true, but I'll, I'll talk about benchmarking a bit later. So in order to avoid this overhead, if the Java tool machine is very busy, sometimes it puts methods over to the level two profiling um, mode, where it only counts very few metrics. And it does this for a while until the C compiler is again less busy where then profiles it a bit more advanced and then again compiles it. And then a, a last typical uh, compilation pattern of a JVM is uh, taking a method, profiling it, and figuring out, okay, this is a trivial method, let's say a getter or a setter, and we have dozens of those in the JVM. That's not even worth compiling. We just go to level zero, a very basic compilation, but we don't have any profiling active anymore. So if you, you can activate as a switch on the JVM, you can do like XX um, advanced profiling options and XX print compilation, you can see what the JVM does. It says like compiled method that and that into level zero, compiled me method that and that into level three, and so forth. So this is basically what your, your hotspot VM is doing in the background of your application. And that's also the reason that if you start up a JVM, it is typically very slow, and that's, um, or compared to how it can be. And that's a very typical thing if you demonstrate something, right? You, you fire up your VM and you say like, let, let me show you, dear, dear, dearest customer, let me show you this new routine I've written. And you show it with a cold VM, uh, we, we like to say in performance um, um, yeah, context. And if you show a cold VM, this VM will behave way uh, less performant than it will after a day of working out things where everything has been compiled with a proper profile, right? That's something you have to take into consideration. As a matter of fact, uh, in, in like performance um, critical systems like day trading, um, people write extra routines to train a Java virtual machine to a certain profile. So I don't even want to take this instant life bef before it has reached a certain compilation point, right? I'll just fire you fake um, stock exchange data um, into your pipeline, but I'll disconnect the backend that executes the orders, right? I just want to train the hotspot compiler for this data so that when I take it live, it is already ready and it doesn't spend its time compilation, uh, compiling. All right, yeah, so this is, this is how hotspot works, this is how compilation works, this is how the JIT compiler works uh, in, in general. So the next thing I want to do with you is I want to take you through some compilation steps. I, we look at very simple Java code and we look into how the JVM executes this code or how it changes the code. 
because that's, that's also a point about bytecode. Bytecode is simply a metaphor. Bytecode byte describes a program in a very, very generic manner to the JVM, and then the JVM uh, has to find a, a performant program that does the exact same thing, but in a much faster way. So this is basically the contract between you as a developer and your Java virtual machine that is executing code. Okay, so the, the most crucial optimization, and if you only take away this one thing and afterwards you think like, wow, this is um, difficult, I, I'll, I'll swap out, then you already have learned the most crucial um, part about performant Java, Java programs, right? So what we have here is a very simple program. We have a class foo and a method bar, right? A method bar is a very simple method. It just prints hello. But we never call bar directly. Uh, we have it wrapped in some other method. So we have this do something method and it takes uh, an, an instance of foo and calls bar. And we now want to pretend that the hotspot virtual machine compiles the method do something and we walk through how it does that. One problem with um, calling a method here is that bar is a virtual method, right? You can override any method um, in a Java program. And that didn't, this wasn't supposed to be um, a thing. Like in C++, you have to declare methods virtual explicitly in C Sharp as well. Uh, and the, the background is that virtual method dispatch is very expensive. And I'll, I'll explain in a second why it is very expensive. And Java changed this. And it could change this because of profile-based optimization. It's because your JVM looks into your code and most of the time, and the most crucial thing is that the JVM can delete virtual codes, uh, vir virtual calls and transform them into non-virtual calls. And in this case, we'll just figure out in a second if this is possible. The problem with calling bar here is that while compiling do something here, we don't know what type foo actually has. Maybe foo was overridden by another class, right? Or extended and overwrite wrote bar. So we don't really know what method to, co to, to call here. So and if we don't know what method to call, there's not much we can optimize here. So this call site, and that's, that's the, the term for it, calling bar here as a call site, um, we don't really know where to go. We will probably go to, to bar, but we don't really know, so we cannot really change the code here. So why is virtual calling a method expensive? So every method in Java in the so-called code cache region uh, has a virtual method table. And the virtual method table is just that. It's a table that lists all methods that are virtual. So like hash code equals to string, but also bar. So class foo has um, bar and it has some um, basically uh, in index 8 method bar and then it has an address to the code that is a system out print and hello. So this is linked at this place, right? But then we can create a class sub that extends foo and override it. And there, in this uh, virtual method table uh, at index 8 still, we still have um, bar, but we have a different link to a different machine code site, right? Or a different bytecode site. And since we have this, we cannot really bind it. So what we have to do is, at every time we call do something, we have to go to this type's virtual method table and go to method 8 in this case and find the machine code. So this is a triple indirection. Every time we call a method, we have to check what type it is, then we have to go to the method table, and then we have to go to offset 8 to find the actual method and jump there, right? So this is how the C, the C code would look like if we implemented uh, a similar program. And there's one benefit already, however, compared to C++, and that, that Java has single um, inheritance, right? You cannot extend more than one class. And the advantage here is that we can uh, say, okay, method bar will always be at index 8. That's already something that makes the Java virtual machine uh, faster in context to virtual method dispatch compared to a C++ program where we cannot rely on this and we actually have to search the entire table for the method we want to dispatch, right? So, but that would be very inefficient if we always did this. Let's say we call do something 10 million times in a program. Then we have to do three steps every time we call a method. And that's the, the point, right? Optimizing this sounds ridiculous. It's, that's just three steps in a program. That's not much. But it will be three steps for every time you call a method in a Java program. And if you just try, if you estimate how many method calls your Java program has for just clicking a button on a website, it goes in the tens of thousands method, method calls. If we didn't optimize this properly, then we would have three times 
an action for every call which would be incredibly slow. You couldn't run Java in a performant requirement system. So the easiest way would be to introduce a cache, right? And caches were the first good solution. Um, the, the precedence of Java, small talk in a way, or small talk uh, was the precedence of strong talk, which in a way inspired Java, the language, well, at that time, Oak, the language, which then was uh, the precedence of, of, of Java. Uh, they used caches a lot. And caches are good because it, we just basically store um, a lookup table at the actual call site. And we say, OK, we have seen the instance of, of a class foo before here. It wasn't overridden. So we just remember where we jumped to the last time. We jumped to hello, Printlen. Um, so we just remember where this address is. And if we uh, encounter the same instance, um, then, or it's not the same class, I mean, then we just jump back to the same address. And that's reasonable, right? Let's say um, this method is never overridden. Then this will always work. Then we just have reduced a three-step lookup uh, to a two-step lookup. So in terms of method calls, we have made our program 30% faster. And 30% faster, this sounds already much more, right? A, a program that runs in two-thirds of the time as it did before is already a much faster program. And this could be a way to improve things. But as a matter of fact, the JVM doesn't use this methodology anymore. The JVM has evolved this methodology a bit further. So instead of having a cached link, the Java virtual machine makes so-called speculative uh, optimizations. And that's, that's, that is exactly what it sounds like. The JVM guesses a lot. The JVM just makes assumptions about your program uh, that it hopes it holds, right? So whenever you call a method virtually, it just says, okay, I encountered a class foo here once, so let me just assume that this method call will always uh, receive an uh, instance of foo and not sub, right? I'll just make this an assumption. In order to validate that my program is still correct, the Java virtual machine does, however, add a so-called uncommon trap. An uncommon trap is something that a processor can produce uh, very efficiently um, where it basically just steps out the execution if the assumption was wrong. But if it was right, the Java virtual machine can now just jump to, to bar. So we now can basically do the same thing in just one instruction. So we uh, reach to something, and as long as this assertion holds, we just jump to bar. And this is something that's called monomorphism. And monomorphism is a, a term that you will hear a lot when you Google Java performance. Monomorphic call sites, so not overriding methods, is basically a crucial uh, yeah, um, assumption that every performant Java program and even more crucially libraries need to hold in order to execute um, efficiently. It doesn't mean that you don't override it. It means that you never um, receive different arguments from a different call site, right? And this is just the first step. The, the reason that um, monomorphism is so important, or linked call sites are so important, is that the JVM aggressively inlines code now. So once you go to, this is still one indirection, and the next thing to do, no, no, I'll do this later, sorry. So, okay, so um, I just established basically these, these different things. We have a call site that sees a lot of things. Let's say you have an interface in your program, right? Like, like an input stream. An input stream can be everything. And if a JVM encounters an input stream, it cannot really speculate in a very well manner. Will this be a file input stream? Will this be just a byte array input stream? Then this call site will, by definition, be very slow. But as long as you have a well-structured program where things are always executed in a similar manner, the Java virtual machine will just optimize for you and um, basically avoid virtual method calls. And this is, it sounds like a stupid device, but uh, it is really true um, if you want to write an efficient program, avoid unnecessary virtual method calls. There's a whole spectrum of virtual method calls. There's, we just uh, discovered monomorphism, where you have a direct link, uh, right? Where the JVM just treats the call site as if it wasn't virtual at all. And think about getters, setters. Why are these getters, setters not slower than field access? And they used to be, and that's what I mentioned in the beginning, right? Stack Overflow tells you avoid uh, getters and setters. If it's a really performance-critical application, just access the field directly, um, it will be faster. But it's not true, because we have a direct link here. This direct link will just directly access the field once it is encountered. And then we have a lot of biomorphic calls as well. And, and getters and setters or monomorphic calls, that's an average Java program that makes 90% of all method calls, so, so it really works. 
Um, then we have mostly data structures, let's say lists, for example, or sets, where you encounter at most two different types, and that's still very efficient, right? Uh, the Java virtual machine will still treat them as almost um, monomorphic, but once you have more than one type, uh, uh, two types at one call site, um, we have megamorphism, where the Java virtual machine will do exactly what I showed you in the beginning. It will always go to the virtual method table. You will generate enormous uh, overhead. If you, if you escalate something, let's say this, this is something that can really change a program's performance dramatically, you change a small line of code, and one call site suddenly discovers three types instead of previously two types, you might destroy a whole chain of optimizations just because um, we don't jump to the target anymore, right? And this is basically um, the, the spectrum, and the Java virtual machine makes these assertions, uh, observes your program, generates a profile by observing, and it basically optimizes uh, once it has proven, okay, this is, this is always um, monomorphic, I'll change the code, I'll recompile this method in the JIT compiler, and just replace the old machine code with this new machine code. And then again, if the assertion doesn't hold anymore, um, let's say you have, I don't know, you, have, you write a, a trading system and, and I don't know, a different market opens, U United States um, stock exchange opens, uh, and suddenly you get like trades with the United States um, type, right? Then the Java virtual machine de-optimizes your code. That's, that's basically what a JVM does. When your program is running, the JVM is permanently observes your code and changes it accordingly to what is happening in your program. And this is something you need to be aware of once um, you have to write performant code, right? So and, um, if, you, if you change a little line and you have a small, uh, you have a huge performance difference and it's just an executing uh, method somewhere, then having changed from a direct link to a vtable lookup is, is a very uh, likely, likely reason for, for this change, right? So, um, I, I already spoiled it before. Uh, why is monomorphism so, Im so important? Still um, breaking down from 30 to, to uh, three indirections to one indirection doesn't sound like much. Um, and if you think about it, most processors aren't so busy most of the time that it really should make a difference. The advantage, however, is that once you have made this assumption here and you just link the, direct, uh, the foo method directly, uh, the foo class directly, the Java virtual machine starts inlining your code. And inlining means it basically copy pastes your code into the target method. And this is the, the actual outcome here now. Um, we basically have created a program where this bar method call doesn't exist anymore. And the Java virtual machine does this down to a level of nine methods. So if you, just, if you have a chain of nine methods, it might be uh, as if you never call any of these methods. And then this might, makes, a, makes a huge performance difference, right? because you save yourself nine dispatches. If you just create one megamorphic call site in between and you break the inlining in this chain of, uh, of, of monomorphic call sites of these nine method calls, then let's say you, you break the first one, you destroy the entire optimization, right? The Java virtual machine cannot copy uh, code anymore. And the problem or the advantage with copying code is that the more code you have in a method, the better you can optimize it. Let's say, uh, you have a method that says one plus the return value of foo. And then I inline foo and foo says uh, I always return two. Then I have two plus two, which it can be uh, optimized to four. But you can only make this last optimization of adding these two numbers prematurely once you have inlined the code, right? So inlining is, is the so-called Uber optimization of the JVM. Okay, so every type matters. Uh, one thing, and this is the, f the first real uh, concrete performance advice is avoiding types. I already mentioned that. So one example is uh, people like to create their own types to just add some some small methods for convenience, or they um, like to they like to um, do the following here. Have you seen this uh, so-called double brace initialization? Um, this sounds very innocent, right? You people like this, and, and for example, for field uh, initializations, they they create a double brace here, which basically defines a constructor within a subclass of ArrayList. That's what we do here. We create a subclass of ArrayList, an anonymous class, where the constructor adds two elements. If the above code, where we call list size, uh, always only encountered an ArrayList and a linked list, or a linked list, we still had bimorphism. We, at most, encountered two different types at the size call site, right? 
Bimorphism means the JVM still inlines our code, or yeah, basically inlining ends at bimorphism. Once we have created this new type here, this new array list, uh, we have added a third type, and the size call can no longer be optimized. The size call now has um, basically turned from an inlined uh, bimorphic call site uh, to a megamorphic call site where nothing gets inlined anymore. And it's, it looks innocent, but it can have uh, really yeah, noticeable performance impacts on your program because you change the profile of the JVM, and by the profile, you change its optimization behavior. And basically, the assumption that the Java to machine developers make is that you write good code. You don't make weird things like that, but people uh, sometimes uh, do it in order to, to yeah, make their code more pretty, but it has really an impact. And it's also, it's, this is actually something that makes a difference which language you use. Um, in theory, it doesn't matter if you use Clojure or Java or Scala. It all compiles to bytecode, then it's all the same thing, right? But the Java virtual machine doesn't really work like that. The Java virtual machine makes a lot of assumptions about your code, and the assumptions are based on what they think is, is typical coding behavior. So if a, a dynamic language especially, like Clojure, or if you compile JavaScript on the JVM, if they have to create weird patterns with a lot of virtual calls in order to make their language specification work on the JVM, these languages will be slower. And this is a, for a fact. In the performance uh, spectrum, everybody writes code in Java because Java maps the best to, to machine code. Um, it doesn't necessarily make a big difference, but um, I, just, um, I just rewrote a, a Twitter framework that is written in Scala because it boxes a lot, creates a lot of garbage, creates a lot of uh, megamorphic call side. Um, it's, I'm not saying that my program that I wrote in Java was better, but the simple fact that it got compiled much better, we, we basically were able to do it in 10% of the time. And um, I'm also not saying that, that these languages are bad, but they're much more challenging in, in the respect to, to these, these general advice things. They're much more difficult to, to handle in these languages. Right. Okay, uh, so let's do a little experiment, right? This one here is a, a stereotypical um, example. You can turn on inlining here, uh, print inlining, uh, and, and the control switch once you start the program. This is a prototype of a megamorphic program. Foo.m will be either sub one, sub two, or sub three. This is three types for M, right? So it is megamorphic. So how can we optimize this? How can we trick the Java to machine into optimizing these programs because these, these methods will never be inlined, which makes it a bit slower by definition. So, right? This is the alternative I can suggest here, right? We uh, change it from doing um, a virtual method call uh, by basically adding a switch statement. And the switch statement, we jump to either one, two, or three, where we then call the static method directly. And this is a thought experience. This is not advice that you go to work on Monday and you change all your method calls to something like that. Um, this won't be very um, maintainable and it will not be um, efficient either necessarily because you uh, basically force the JVM to compile something that it decided to not compile, right? The, the Java to machine doesn't refuse compilation of megamorphic call sites because it wants to be an asshole, right? Uh, the problem is that resources are, are sparse. If you copy, a if you inline a megamorphic call site, you have to already inline at least three methods uh, with an if statement, right? These methods will become huge, and at some point, the JVM will take up fem five gigabytes of your memory just to compile these methods, and you won't be happy either. But this is actually a way to force the JVM to doing it. And the simple trick is that we here have um, three call sites, and they're all static. And static call sites, since they're not virtual, can always be inlined. Right? And this is basically, I hope this just exemplifies what the Java virtual machine does. It is performance optimizations of the Java virtual machine. They follow simple rules. Once you understand these rules, and it's really here, one, two, three, you can approximately tell what the JVM is doing. Right, okay. So, um, one thing to, to basically, let's, let's compile a, a method that's a bit more difficult, right? And this is something you probably have seen, these log methods. they all over every program. And log methods are actually, I think logging is, is in ma many enterprise applications. If you just disable logging, you already have solved the performance crisis uh, because logging is, is very expensive. Ideally, it wouldn't be, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you in a second why logging often is such a bottleneck. Okay, let's say we have written this log method here, right? 
uh, and it's static and it prints all of its arguments. It's not a very good log because um, println is always bad. Println is internally synchronized. So once you, and synchronization is basically the death to all performance uh, in the first place because all threads have to wait for each other thread to log and then they hibernate and then they go back. They have to flush the caches. It's not very good. So, um, but if we call log from some method and again do something, and now we give it three different types. One string, one integer, and one object type. So we have three types. This, by definition, would make the arc call side and the log method megamorphic, right? We cannot inline here anymore. We have a virtual method dispatch for two string every time we encounter something because we are not monomorphic anymore and not bimorphic either. And for a log method, this is typical. A log method takes anything as an argument and logs it then. However, since the log method itself is static, right, the Java virtual machine will inline the log method into do something. And this inlining, now this copy pasting, creates room for more optimizations. Because now we know um, the arguments, we know the exact arguments and their types that will always be encountered at this call site. So with help of another optimization called loop unrolling, Basically, the Java virtual machine will now know that this loop always goes by three arguments. And what is more efficient than looping three times? It is just copy pasting. Again, the body of the loop will just end up with this. And now the Java virtual machine has, in a way, created a, a megamorphic call site and transformed it into, a mon into three monomorphic call sites where everything can be inlined again. And this is crucial, right? As long as the log method here is inlineable, and it is because it's static and we don't throw different loggers at this call site here, down there. Um, we can inline and we can go down this chain of optimizations. Once you create megamorphic log methods, or if, once you create any central method of an application, and people love to do this, they, ha they have these static utilities somewhere, um, and they, they do something, right? Uh, and if these, these utilities treat very um, megamorphic content, very generic content, and you make, some, you make something happen that uh, avoids the inlining, you're basically shutting down the JVM's optimizations. And then a program is, is slow automatically. So what I do if I go into a program and I, they tell me like, okay, this is taking forever to just press this button, uh, I, I look at, okay, is there some big blob of code somewhere that is called from everywhere? So if you have these central focal points of code that cannot be inlined, for example, the Java virtual machine doesn't inline methods that are too big. 325 bytes of bytecode is the, is the cutoff value for a, in, a method for, to be inlined. If a method is too big and it takes too generic content, um, you will probably have the program run at 20% of its potential. Right? And this is, why, this is why I said before, if you understand monomorphism and the, the, the consequences of monomorphism with inlining and what it does, you have already learned 50% of what it takes to, to do performance analysis Everything else is, is nice to know, but this is really the crucial uh, element of any efficient Java program. And uh, since the, the last talk took a lot of examples uh, using streams, right? And what are streams? Streams take very generic input too, right? So if you distribute streams over many methods, and um, if, if these methods don't get merged together to one big method where the stream can basically be erased, uh, streams can also be very slow so uh, compared to iteration and simply because um, you basically externalize the logic, the actual dispatching of, of, the, of the, um, the, the objects that you're processing to different um, methods. If they cannot be inlined, the optimization of these methods cannot be as efficient as it should be. Right? So, so it's always important. In my, in my eyes, it's a simplified advice, but Never distribute streams around the different methods. You shouldn't do that anyways because they're mutable um, by definition, but, but it's also very important for what the JIT compiler does. Okay, so broken it down, and I, I make this, I mean, this is stupid, right, in a way. This is too simple, but in a general fashion, you can say one type is good and many types are always bad, right? And, and if you keep this in mind, you can uh, get a lot out of out of an algorithm that's crucial. Let's say you have a batch routine, right? If the batch routine is running slow, sometimes it really helps. And, and the most extreme example I had in practice is that I rewrote a batch routine to just use fewer types. And we broke it down from 10 hours runtime to four minutes. And it's simply because there was this one focal point 
where the JVM just backed out and said like, nope, I'm not touching this method and then uh, everything else broke down. So, in the end, uh, it breaks down to using efficiently, that uh, you use types efficiently to structure your program in a way. Um, and I'm taking a shot here at JavaScript. Um, because also JavaScript, and I'm, I'm making a short diversion now, any, Java virtual, any virtual machine works like the JVM in a way today. That's true for the CLR that executes .NET code, um, and that's, that's true for V8 that executes JavaScript code. They all have JIT compilers, and they all optimize code while they're running. So if you're opening a web page in, in Chrome, right, the V8 engine will look at the JavaScripts um, that are delivered with the web page, and they will also transform them into something that's executed more efficiently um, on the platform that you're running the browser on. So um, let's look at some code here. Um, how does V8 compile things? And we define here an, an object foo, and we add two properties, foo and 42, x and y. And, uh, the, job, uh, the, the V8 engine also adds types in order to do the same monomorphism optimizations as before. But since we don't have types in JavaScript, um, the V8 engine actually tries to guess types. So uh, an object without any property just gets a basic root type, right? So this is a star here, a so-called hidden class. Then by adding foo, you create a new type that has a property x with type string. And by adding y, you basically create a new type x, y with string and integer. And these types are hierarchical in V8, so they inherit from each other. And now we create another object, bar, uh, where you have um, y and x, but you define it in a different order. Now V8 guesses a different type here. This is still star, but now we have a new type y, and here we have y, x. So these types aren't equal anymore, so inlining cannot be done, uh, devirtualization cannot be done. This JavaScript program will be slower um, as it will be um, if you had exchanged the order of these two properties. And just another example, JavaScript has the same thing. If a method becomes too big, right, um, it cannot be inlined anymore. And guess how uh, the size of a, of a JavaScript method is, is calculated. It's basically it's string size. It's two string size. And if you like to have an argument for the old uh, white spaces versus tabs discussion, right, what is smaller, four white spaces or one tab? So I, I made a JavaScript program faster by replacing white spaces with tabs. Smaller methods, more inlining, twice performance. Um, it's, it sounds ridiculous, it is ridiculous, but that's the thing, right? Computers, we like to talk about programs, type theory and algebraic data types and blah, blah, blah. Uh, in the end, this is a machine. It's, it's cables running through semiconductors, uh, processes that just look at, at things in a very um, dumb way. Computers aren't smart. They, they are very fast, but they process numbers. And we have to, at some point, we just estimate a lot. We just say, okay, a method is supposed to be that big. If it's bigger than that, um, we probably have more negatives than positives. So we don't inline it anymore because inlining will be expensive. And that's how a machine thinks. If you don't recognize that, if you have too much trust in the intelligence of your compilers, uh, you will be punished, and slow programs are, are in a way, the, 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 the bill you get for that. So in a way, all programs are typed. Programs, um, computers are typed. Computers process register ad, um, contents, right? And register pro uh, content needs to basically be a number or a string or something. If the JVM always has to process metadata for every bit it reads, or any machine uh, has to process bits uh, in a certain way, uh, where it doesn't really know what this bit means, then the optimizations or the, the performance impact of this meta analysis on the long run will be something that costs you resources. That's something your computer is doing instead of executing your program. Okay, so um, the second most important um, yeah, thing that you need to know uh, about the JVM is and uh, not only, or well, it's mostly about processes here, it's not only about virtual method calls, it's about the flip side of the coin that is branch prediction. So you can, in a way, uh, like I showed before, uh, I, I showed a switch instead of a virtual method call. Here I'll show you um, an if-else, which is basically a, a switch statement to some extent. It's also a branch. Um, you can always model uh, virtual method calls as if-else as well, as, as well, right? So in small talk, you can do it the other way around. You can, if is in a way, a, a virtual method call is a method if-else, right? 
So in order to avoid uh, virtual calls, we here just write a simple program where we generate a random array of 10, 000, uh, 20,000 values from zero to 100. And um, now we wanna add the values of this array, right? We just wanna sum them up uh, to, to, yeah, we wanna know how big the, the, number is, the numbers are in this array. And we don't do this once, we do it 10,000 times. So in this outer inner loop, uh, we do the sum, so this is this part here, and then we have this uh, 1,000 times. So now, guess how we can make this program faster? Well, the problem here is that this is a control flow, all right? We check if the value is 50, and if the value is bigger than 50, we add the number. If it is smaller than 50, we subtract the number. So we don't sum them up in technically, but we basically have a, uh, yeah. It, I mean, this is, this is just an example. It doesn't really make sense. Um, but what the problem here is that the JVM, again, doesn't really know what it is doing inside of the loop. Or, and most, the biggest problem is that the processor doesn't know what it is doing in the loop. Processors like to have predictable instruction sets. So processors like to uh, know, okay, now add 10, add 20. And processors have basically pipes of these instructions. And every click, right, every, every hertz that the, program is, uh, the process is triggered to execute an instruction, it likes to do something. If the if else is in this pipeline, basically what means uh, first compare if the number is bigger than 50, and if the number is bigger than 50, then add it. If it's not bigger than 50, then don't execute this add instruction, which is already in your pipeline, right? You have to tell a process in advance what it is doing. If you can only tell a processor in the last second before it should do something, what it is supposed to do, this program will be slow because the processor basically has to skip instructions in the pipe. You can only tell the processor um, if it is 50, go to the next instruction which is adding. If it is not smaller than 50, then don't do anything for three clicks. So if your processor is not doing anything every, every fifth click for three clicks, then you already waste 30% of your processor's capacity. That's in a way what it's doing. So in order to avoid this pipeline flushing, how it's called, we can do this, array sort values. And when we sort the array, the processor will always do the same thing um, for the first half of the array and then do always the other thing for the other half of the array, right? And now your program became more predictable. So even though we waste energy and time on sorting the array, we only do this once. After that, your processor can always basically predict what it is supposed to be doing. So it doesn't even um, basically check anymore. It just adds an assertion. If the number is um, smaller than 50, I just flush my pipe completely and wait for new instructions. But other than that, I'll just add. I'll just add. It's like, think of a train that's running fast. It takes a lot of time to stop it, right? And it takes a lot of time to get it going again. Uh, if basically a train is going fast for, for a long, long time and then has to stop abruptly because something's wrong and has to go back a bit, maybe even, and then it goes another trail, that's fast. If it has to stop every five minutes abruptly and then it can go on, that's slow. This is how processors work. Processors are machines basically that just f are fed by, it's like Pac-Man, right? It goes through instructions. If you stop it, um, you have to restart the whole pipeline and, and it will take a lot of time. So in a way, what I'm telling you is make your programs predictable. Don't have erratic branches. Random stuff is very, very expensive, right? Um, for the simple nature of what the JVM does, it, it, or what a computer does. A computer walks through instructions. If you have to skip instructions, um, you, you uh, lose time. Okay, um, I have 10 minutes left. This is a very long talk. In theory, it can go for three hours, but uh, people get tired, so I only do this if I'm really hired to do a performance training. Um, so uh, one, one thing, uh, now let's skip this actually. Um, yeah, so escape analysis, much more important. Um, again, I told you about inlining. Um, in Java, object allocations aren't expensive anymore. It's not, it's not so bad to allocate an object. What is, however, expensive is garbage collection. So allocating the object goes fast, but collecting the object again is slow, especially uh, if, if you do it a lot, because then um, you have to stop the entire virtual machine in a way. Many garbage collectors basically stop everything for a few milliseconds every now and then. And again, if you have a trading system, for example, stopping your program for a few milliseconds is not a good idea often, because you sell an order, right? You sold the order, 
um, at, at $1.50. Three milliseconds, uh, the order is down to one fifth forty nine. If you says, uh, sold a million shares, you just lost $100,000. So uh, garbage is expensive uh, in, in all, all the ways you can think of the words meaning. So if you have seen this, right, uh, the, the new for each loop in Java, what does this boil down to? Actually, this is synthetic sugar for this thing. What we have here is an object allocation. So people often say, okay, I don't want to allocate objects and I just use the old iteration way. However, um, that's something that the Java virtual machine engineers considered. So if you have an object allocation within a method and you can say, okay, this iterator will only ever be used in, this, in these few lines here, then the Java virtual machine is smart enough to not even allocate this object on the heap. And we have a lot of focus on this in the Java 10 development, the Valhalla project uh, will introduce um, stack allocated objects in a way. This is the big change in Java 10. This is basically the lambda expressions of the pre-Jigsaw release, where you can explicitly tell the VM to not allocate an object. But even today already, the JVM um, um, already is smart enough that if an object only lives in a certain scope, it will not allocate this object on the heap, but keep it on the stack which basically avoids the garbage collection afterwards because if you never allocate an object, you never have to collect it, right? So if you don't let objects escape from a method, this can ver be very crucial uh, on your garbage collection performance. Your garbage collector will spin much more if you send around objects. Primitive types in a way are good. And this is my main concern with languages like Scala, right? Scala compiles to bytecode. If you have an integer in Scala, you don't have a primitive int anymore. Many times, the, Java com uh, the Scala compiler cannot prove that an integer is never null. And if it cannot prove that, it needs to box every value. This generates a lot of garbage. This is basically um, why, why rewriting Scala libraries often can gain you a lot of performance because you, uh, you do mutability and you do primitive types, two things that functional programmers laugh about, but in, in terms of hardware performance, it's, it's much better because you save yourself from garbage collection. So the stack is good, the heap is bad, uh, and, and Java allows you beautifully to avoid the heap if you know how to. Actually, many, if you know, like Peter Laurie or Martin Thompson, these uh, high performance people, their libraries, they often zero garbage. So they don't allocate any object on any call. You just allocate the objects once and then you interact with them. So you never have garbage collection in trading hours, for example. Okay, um, how much time do I have left? Five minutes, six minutes? Okay, perfect. Five minutes, so I'll do one last um, yeah, tricky one where people often uh, get confused. Okay, so we, we know now uh, that we can um, basically have different code yielding different machine uh, on very small changes. So we would like a way to measure things, right? And I permanently feel like I should measure if A is better than B. So let's write a small benchmark. And let's execute this. Let's measure how much time it takes to uh, add the sum of 20,000 values, right? We want to compare Java to other programs. This is something you can implement in any language. So let's check what this is. And I already talked about this warm-up phase in the beginning. That we obviously are missing, but there's something even more wrong here. The Java virtual machine uh, has very aggressive dead code elimination. So after inlining especially, it often is like that certain branches, for example, are never true. In this case, we're just adding numbers to a, a sum, and then we're not doing anything with it. So the Java virtual machine looks at this program and says, like, what is this guy doing here? This part here, the sum is never used. I'll, I'll delete this. So um, basically, you implemented this, this, this benchmark, and then you get system out print and took zero milliseconds. So I'm like, woo, Java, the fastest language in the universe, right? <laughs> um, and this is something that people, this is basically, Half of my stack overflow uh, flow points come from saying like, nope, here, yeah, um, you forgot that code elimination. Right, the JVM will also delete this. So basically you end up with system current time millis. And also current time millis is a bad method in this context because it is a bound clock. Uh, so the Java virtual machine basically caches the value and increments it. And then every so and so many milliseconds it goes back to the operating system and asks, did I go too fast? and then it resets the clocks to an older value. So this might, even on my machine sometimes prints, took minus two milliseconds, so wow, even better. Um, so th there's everything wrong with this benchmark. I'll, I'll haste through this now. Um, 
a better benchmark, first of all, we need to do warm up. So we do 10,000 executions of the benchmark before we run the benchmark. This way, 10,000 is actually the ma magic default value on hotspot. And after a, a program should be um, C2 compiled in level four, right? So better run 20,000 iterations, but 10,000 should be enough. And then what we do down here, we use nanotime, which is not a system bound clock. That's why nanotime is basically a random value, but it is basically incremented in a continuous fashion. And then here we print out the sum because now the JVM cannot tell us anymore. This, this is not used. It cannot say, okay, you know what? I know you're not looking at the console output. I'm not printing it. That's not a correct program anymore. It's forbidden by the JVM specification. And then we print what it took, but only the last time, so we print it out there, this time for real, we do the benchmark, we get the number, and we have something that we can work with. So this is a valid benchmark, even though it looks like we're doing a lot of work that we shouldn't. Fortunately, there's a, the, a framework uh, written by Alexei Shipilev, um, if you heard of him. He's probably, the more east you get, the more people know him, typically. Uh, and JMH is a really great, I use it a lot. So what we do here is we have a setup method, which is basically outside of the scope of the measurement. And then we just write the benchmark that we want to, and then we return the value that we basically want to be considered as part of the equation we're trying to measure. So by returning the sum, JMH makes sure that the sum isn't basically non-required, that the benchmark method isn't deleted um, by that code elimination. And this way we have something you can work with. This is of course much better to read and much easier to create than spinning our own benchmark. All right, so now I just jumped through a lot of slides <laughs> because um, I said this is a long talk in theory, two hours. Um, and yeah, see, this is a lot. Um, but just go through the slides, that's why I don't delete them. You see there's a lot of stuff. They are supposed to be readable by anybody. Um, finally, um, I think one minute, a fool with a tool is still a fool. Once you measure a system, you change the system. Just keep this in, in mind, right? Uh, if you uh, enable performance monitors on your application, you will not have the same program anymore. Your JVM will change its uh, optimization behavior and in this context, the JVM space is bad. There's basically two tools that, uh, that you can really trust. When sh is one is um, um, Honest Profiler, which is free on GitHub, and the other one is um, Flight Recorder, which comes with Oracle JDK, uh, because they measure differently. Otherwise, what you have is that many tools are relying on getting basically time to dispatch their code, and then this is part of the measurement, and also they cannot measure at random times uh, but they have to wait for certain so-called safe points where uh, you always see a certain snapshot of your program. So you cannot, since the JVM is changing so much around, right? If you, know, uh, if you wanna measure how long it takes a method to run a method, then you might actually um, create a scenario where this method actually matters while before it didn't, so it was deleted. So in a real application, it would have taken zero seconds to run it, while in your measurement it takes 10,000 seconds. So be very careful about it. Also, you can always take a look at the assembly yourself. There's a great tool called uh, JITWatch, um, um, which you can also download, so you can really know what's happening. This is basically the only ultimate way to know what's going on in your app. All right, and that's it for me. Thank you so much for coming. I'll give you another talk after.